Aloha. Uh, this is Think Tank Hawaii. Welcome to this show on Think Tech. Uh, this show is the state of the state of Hawaii, and I'm your host, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. We have a guest today, Brooks Bear, who is an official um, on the Department of Health's COVID-19 and pandemic response team. And he serves as the Department of Health's uh, communications person and as spokesperson. So we uh, have an excellent resource here for discussing Hawaii's success in rolling out COVID vaccinations and other helpful support for our, our response to the, to the pandemic. He's also been quoted in many newspaper articles and many newscasts, so I know we have a reliable resource here and we can ask any questions and get some really quality answers. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we, uh, particip we really appreciate Brooke's participation in Think Tech Hawaii, and uh, I do want to welcome him now as my guest on the State of the State of Hawaii. So welcome, Brooks. Stephanie, thank you so much. Uh, I will try to live up to that good billing. You know, there is so much good information um, that uh, we would like to share um, about COVID-19, about the ongoing vaccination effort, about how people can continue to protect themselves and protect the, their neighbors and all of Hawaii uh, as we continue to deal with this really horrible pandemic. So thank you for the opportunity. Any chance we get where we can share information, we embrace it. So, and, and, and uh, you gave me good billing. I'll, I'll try to answer any, any questions, uh, the softballs and the hardballs too. Well, we'll take that offer seriously because as we go forward, we um, are going to be real interested to know how all of us are progressing in our challenge to get vaccinated completely. Because we do, if we even getting over this first hump, which I'll ask you about, we, we then have the second round. And that's certainly you, your accomplishment for the your departments and the state of Hawaii's effort to get this first round done is is certainly w worthy and um, tremendous effort. But you know you, you got to do it again. So two times that's Mount Everest. So I think uh, you know we'll probably like to talk again. And I really appreciate that offer. Well, why why don't you start out telling us from your vantage point and your information? Um, is the distribution process going well? Is this progressing well for everybody? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, let me tell you, first of all, that this this really is kind of uh, a Herculean effort because nothing like this has ever been uh, a template, attempted or accomplished before, not only in Hawaii, but around the country and the world to try to vaccinate so many people, inoculate so many people in such a short period of time. That's really never been done but it is so critically important that we get this done. So we're charging full steam ahead um, with our partners at the CDC and our partners all around Hawaii, whether it be um, in the local hospitals, at the county level, at the federally qualified health centers, uh, the pharmacies, we are all partnering to try to get as many shots in arms as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we said from the beginning that we expected there would be some bumps along the road because again, nothing like this has been attempted before. Um, and there certainly have been bumps along the road. But, you know, when you hit a bump, you don't just roll over and quit, not with something that's this important. This is really life or death. So uh, we, we, we take on the challenges um, and we try to smooth out those bumps. We learn from any mistakes that happen along the way. And we, we continue to try to do better and better and better and, and, and really make this um, as smooth a process as possible. What we're really looking to do is not only make it safe and secure, but orderly. I know that you've seen images from around the country where there are these long, long lines of either cars or sometimes elderly people camped out overnight waiting for a vaccine. That's just not the way we do things here in Hawaii. That doesn't show the aloha, especially to our kupuna. We're not going to have them camp out over, overnight, you know, waiting for a vaccine only to find out that when morning comes, there might not be a vaccine for them. So well, regarding that, uh, and unlike February last year, we did not get the tests. I, I remember being at Kapi'olani and being told that people were going into their emergency room and they had these symptoms and they suspected that they were COVID, but they didn't have the testing kits. So we didn't get the testing kits. Well, then it turned out that nobody did. So Hawaii wasn't disadvantaged just for its own sake. But it looks like now, its own sake being so far away. But um, for now, it looks like we're in the running just as all the states are for 
our, our, our vaccine supplies and those are coming as they should and at the level that it's being distributed even though my, and, and is that enough and are we well, no. yeah you, you, you know that's a great question because right now our our, our, our real struggle is with the supply of vaccine um, we are expecting this week to receive 40,200 doses. That's up about 8,000 from last week and up about 8,000 from the week before. And each of those weeks, we received about 32, 33,000 doses. Um, this week, we're getting a bump up. We have a new administration in Washington. They're trying to grease the skids so we get a better supply, a quicker supply. We definitely appreciate that. Again, 40,200 this week. We think we can easily administer 60 to 70,000 vaccines a week with the infrastructure we already have in place. Now, if we were able to secure an additional 20, 30,000 vaccines and we were able to get our hands on 60, 70,000 vaccines a week and get those shots in arms, you know, we could knock this thing out and have everyone that wants to be inoculated inoculated by the end of August. And that would be just terrific because then we'd have the upper hand on COVID-19. But supply is the problem. Right now, demand far outstrips supply. So many people uh, from so many corners of the island, so many age groups, so many walks of life, so many professions, everyone clamoring for the vaccine. And that's really a good problem to have because the real problem would be if no one wanted to get vaccinated because then we'd have to go out and sell people on the idea. But as everyone sees more and more people getting vaccinations and, and, and they're not having these bad adverse uh, side effects. Yeah, few, uh, some people have had side effects, but we haven't seen any really horrible side effects in Hawaii. And I have seen so many people, um, even you know elderly frail people, they get the vaccine, no problem whatsoever. That's encouraging more and more people to accept uh, the vaccinations. And that's what we really need if we're going to get the upper hand on, on, on COVID-19. And, and as far so as the supply is concerned now, is it that the state could ask for more, but somebody else, like you said, the administration already has uh, gifted us with more. Maybe they did that for everybody, and that's a good sign. They're working really, really hard. But was that asked for? Or, or do Does Governor Ige ask for more or ask for some? Well, what happens on that ordering thing? Is this an automatic? Can you tell us a little bit about how we get it out yeah, here in the Pacific? Yeah. It's an allocation through the federal government. Right now, we're getting both the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Uh, and we we request um, well, the, the federal government gives us an allocation. They say, yeah, this is this is what you know you, you can get, and, and and we want it all. You know, we have not said no to one single dose. In fact, again, we want quite a bit more because we can get those shots in arms as long as we can get you know more supply and. This is not a problem unique to Hawaii, I should point out. This is a problem across the country. Uh, people are clamoring for more doses of vaccine uh, and, and we're optimistic now that, that this is gonna start to take off. You know that uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, is going to be soon applying with the Food and Drug Administration for its emergency use authorization. And if it gets that, um, uh, the CDC would then take a look and, and give recommendations on how the vaccination should be administered. But with FDA, uh, FDA uh, granting an emergency use authorization and recommendations from the CDC, we could soon be using the Johnson Johnson vaccine as well. And that should help increase our supply. So that would be really welcome news. I see. So that would just that would be a third stream in. That's really interesting. I, I did want to ask you, you mentioned that we're likely, if we're on pace as you describe it, if the Department of Health is running a really such a, um, a lickety split operation that's working, um, do you, is there a timeline for getting everybody vaccinated? I think you said by August maybe um, we could be uh, we could have covered all those that are uncomplicated and you know willing to do it. Is that the timeline? Has the state set a, or has the department set a timeline for accomplishing this feat? Yeah, actually, we have a, an image that will help um, ex explain our timeline. Um, and uh, as you know, we started with what was the phase 1A category. And those are the healthcare professionals and residents and, and employees of long-term care facilities. Now, the hospitals were the ones administering the vaccinations um, to healthcare professionals. So if you worked at a hospital, it was very easy. Um, in, in that phase 1A, you would get your inoculation 
uh, through your hospital where you work. If you work, say, in an independent doctor's office or a physical therapist office or a dentist office in a particular community, let's say you worked uh, in Kaneohe in a dentist office, um, you filled out a survey and uh, you would be uh, then linked up with your local hospital in Kaneohe. The example would be um, Adventist Health Castle and you would go to Castle and they would administer the vaccine there. The pharmacies, the big ones, CVS and Walgreens, they've been vaccinating people uh, in the long-term care facilities. So that 1A is pretty much taken care of. Uh, there are still some physicians and people in long-term care facilities uh, who are getting their shots, but we have now, as you know, moved into phase 1B. And phase but, 1B are our Kapuna, 75 and above, right? We, yeah. we wanna get them vaccinated. And that essential workers, but, but first of all, back to 1A. Yeah. How did everybody know to go to peer? To, the thing is, it was like, wasn't the windward sign? I mean, these are kind of nit grit questions, so we can be fast here. But didn't the windward side get it going fast and 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 got really into it and and productive before we did over here in Honolulu? And then all of a sudden, everybody showed up at Pier Two on a Friday, like eight thousand people or so. So what what was that startup? Well, mess? first of all, the 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 one A like. Um, there was no open registration um, for the general public. Um, if you work in the hospital, you, you got vaccinated at your hospital. If you worked at the private uh, health, you know, the, de the independent dentist office or the physical therapist office, you went to our website, which I encourage everyone to visit, which is hawaiicovid19.com. And there was what's called a survey there. And you would um, go to the uh, website and fill out the survey. You would say, uh, I have a dentist office uh, in Kaimuki. Um, I have 12 employees. Uh, 10 of them would like to be vaccinated. And we would receive that information. We would then send that to the hospital. And that hospital would then schedule with that dentist office for those 10 people to come in at a designated time, at a designated place, and be vaccinated. So that was all before these pods opened up. Um, Thank you for that yeah. explanation. And yeah, and, and I can keep talking through that timeline. And I'd also like to talk about the different ways we're administering the vaccines because so much attention is given to the pods, yeah? Um, because, uh, you know, it, it's seen as this mass vaccination site. But the pods or, or points of dispensing are, are really just oh, one of the, of the four ways um, that we are, we are getting the vaccines out there. But let's throw that um, timeline back up there if we can. For just the pod, the four, uh, those are the places. So those are peer two, those are, uh, what well, are the pods? Points okay. of distribution, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the points of dispensing um, are, are, are actually number four on our list of, of methods. So the, the first way we were getting shots out there was the long-term care facilities. And we've talked briefly about that, how the, the big pharmacies would go out and they would go to the uh, Palolo Chinese home or Hawaii Kai retirement home or something. And they would go to these retirement communities and they would administer the vaccine on site. So that was one way. There are more than 1,700 different small care homes or long-term care facilities around the state. Now, there are people living in these homes, maybe three, four people, two, three, four people at each one of these more than 1,700 homes who need to be vaccinated. And they're in 1A. Well, they're not going to end up um, at you know, you can't, you can't have them travel down to, say, the Blaisdell or Pier 2. A lot of these people are homebound, so we need to get the vaccine to let them, deliver it to them. And so we've partnered with a lot of the small pharmacies. These small independent pharmacies go out armed with the doses and the, va and, and the vaccines, the syringes, and they go out into each one of these almost 2,000 homes around the state to administer one by one by one the vaccine. So that's our second way of getting the vaccine out, the large long-term care facility, the small long-term care facility. And there, then there are the very important federally qualified healthcare centers like Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center or Waikiki Health or Kogi Palmama. Um, and and um, we are working with those different organizations in the communities because they serve uh, sometimes uh, communities that ha have trouble, uh, maybe English as a second language, um, or uh, they, they have uh, different socioeconomic disadvantages that preclude them from getting some of the information that we'd like them to have. So we work with these wonderful partners to reach all these different communities uh, that the FQHCs serve. And then we get to the pods, which is really the fourth 
um, and final approach to, to getting the, the shots in arms. And our first pods were called closed pods. Those were in the hospitals, only open to those healthcare workers, right? And then we had a, a pod at like Leeward Community College. That was for first responders, you, fire, police, paramedics. And now the, the, the pods that everyone thinks are these mega or larger pods, and those are the peer twos, and those are the Blaisdells. So those now open up to a, a bit of a broader population. But if you go back to the timeline right now, we're in 1B. So it's the Kapuna 75 and above, and it is um, the frontline essential workers. Uh, and there are uh, in so the community about 230,000. About the pods. Okay, so we understand that. And all of the people that were serviced within those pods who are in the highest level of the tiers, right? So they're in tier 1A, all yeah. the people that were served in that uh, beautifully, it sounds like, um, in, in those uh, smaller facilities and larger facilities, but you're still following the ranking of the tiers. And it's very important that, that people do that. You know what we need out there is, is a lot of aloha uh, for the people who might be in front of you in line, because a lot of people want to get the vaccine but it would really be great if everyone could just step back, really identify truly where they are um, in, in the succession of who should you know, get the vaccine first. And if someone's in front of you, let's let those kupuna, let's let those frontline essential workers you know, get it uh, maybe before you if, if you're not you know, in that category. Uh, we've had some kind of line skipping and line jumping uh, and we, we'd like to ask everybody to kind of kind of wait their turn. The vaccine's coming and everyone's going to have a shot at it. It's absolutely free, but let's take care of those high risk people first and the people that we need to stay well so they can serve our community. People like, you know, Hawaiian electric workers and the judges and the public defenders and the prosecutors, uh, those kind of the policemen, the firemen. We need those people to be back. The teachers. In re well, yeah, okay, in regard to that, uh, there are people that have um, tried to go to the place and finally H Hawaii's gotten the message that you must have an appointment. But when I, but I've heard that, for instance, at the pods, when the, we had the rainy days, the one that I guess it was a week ago, Monday, Tuesday, with these tremendous rains and big traffic tie up, then people didn't show up for their, for their, their shots, their shot appointment time. And so I think that, uh, yes, that was a nice break for the people that are distributing and working so hard there. And I appreciate that very much and want them to keep going and eat their spinach. But um, what about taking advantage of those openings that are gonna occur? Is there any back, back plan that, well, that allows that opening to go used instead of unused? Yeah, no, first of all, we're not wasting any vaccine. Um, and I hadn't heard that uh, people were not showing up for the vaccine. Um, uh, I certainly would not miss yeah. my opportunity if, if I had. No, no, you know, they, I, could, they couldn't because of the rain and that it just slowed down everything. Uh, um, okay, it, uh, understandable, but I. I uh, tell tales out of school, but anyhow, I have heard that. My, well, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I would encourage everyone to try to make their appointment. Don't show up too early, yeah. but maybe 15 minutes before your appointment time show up. We don't want the traffic jams. But um, I'll tell you what we're not doing is we're not wasting vaccine. In fact, we are actually squeezing often an extra dose out of, you know, the Moderna um, or, or, or the Moderna comes in a vial with five doses, uh, excuse me, 10 doses. Yeah. The Pfizer has five. We're often squeezing a sixth one out. So if we get um, a what's called a pizza box of Pfizer uh, doses, there are supposedly 975 doses in there, but we're often getting at least 100 more than that. Um, and so that's that's great news. And then at the end of the day, if there are one or two left over, and, but you've already broken into the vial, and so you you don't want to throw it out because that that's like liquid gold. You know that's precious cargo. Um, they, they have waiting lists and they will call people and say, hey, come on down, get your shot. So we're really trying hard not to waste anything. That backdrop of getting people in who may not have had, they may not have made an appointment yet or, had, or not, uh, couldn't, couldn't do that for some reason. Well, you know, I just think that uh, the tiers are really helpful, as you say, and if people take the time to look at the tiers and the rankings of all the people, of course, it does raise issues as to for instance, with the balance that has to be established across our country in the states about the formula and the distribution of the, of the vaccinations and the reopening of the economy. I mean, we have a, an issue here 
regarding women at home with children and women who've even given up their jobs. And I'm sure some fathers that have had to also, but we've got the teachers being ambivalent about getting back into schools where they're going to be with all these youngsters. And we still don't know enough about their, their contagion levels or their infection levels or any of that. So my heart goes out to all of the teachers who are trying to make these uh, decisions. Well, now some of them are getting uh, vaccinated. And I understand, is this correct, that Hawaii is accommodating educators and actually any school personnel that um, have to do face, get, you know, or next to children during the day. So what's going on in Hawaii with the teachers? Because it seems to me we've got to get the schools, we've got to open the schools in order to really get the workforce back in place and people making money. Ab absolutely. We not only need to get our kids back in to educate them, but you know, a lot of parents have had to sacrifice uh, on the work front because they've got to stay home with their kids during the day because the kids aren't going to school. So got to get the kids back in school, got to get the parents back on the job. Um, and teachers are right there in phase 1B. They are being vaccinated now, I think in all counties. Um, we are working directly, for example, with the Department of Education. We asked the department, give us lists of people who you uh, prioritize as people who should get the vaccine you know, as early as possible. They then give us names. We received more than 18,000 names already from the Department of Education. We then take those names and we farm them out to the different points of dispensing. And then the teachers are contacted via email. Uh, a, an appointment is scheduled. They're given a date and a time. And, and the teachers are now being vaccinated. Very important that, that uh, we not only protect their health, and we protect uh, the kids' health, and, and we get everybody um, kind of back where they want to be, which is in the classroom and on the job. I know, and th this is very reassuring, and my uh, because we go and even into the grocery stores or the drug stores, and there's all kinds of plastic up and dividers and all of that, and of course their ventilation systems purportedly are updated and are are uh, changed and cleaned and and will catch this virus, but that's not been the case in the schools. That there hasn't been the budget to get in there and really ramp up those ventilators and make sure that their surfaces are protected from. Uh, you know, with or their their exchanger, you know, their kids are surrounded with these plastic, uh, well, the, you know, yeah. The, the, there's, uh, I just saw something over the weekend uh, that suggests that, that uh, in a lot of places, students are actually a lot safer in school than they are at home. And, and that's a credit to the work that educators have done in, in um, spacing the kids out. And actually, in a lot of places, they have found ways to, to segment the, the youngsters and make sure they keep the masks on. Um, we, uh, our um, uh, Doc D, which is Disease Control uh, Division, has gone out to some schools. They went out to schools in Waianae. They went out to the Campbell area, and they they spend time working with the Department of Education um, and and examining the things that the DOE has done to protect our keiki. And actually, uh, our DOE gets very high marks for the work they've done. So we're encouraged. They, they've got blended learning going on already, right? Depending on what kind of infection you have really in your school. Everybody's the beginning teacher when it comes to virtual. Okay, so we're all right back at pretty, you know, base zero, you know, competence in, in making all of that happen. Of course, everybody's gotten much better and quickly over this time, but it is it has been a loss for the youngsters. And I'm sure we're gonna see all of this if we ever get back to doing the tests again. But um, I think that uh, bringing um, those, the DOE acknowledging and you all seeing that, you know, a high school teacher can see 150 kids every day. I mean, 150 people, you know, and be close to them for a long time. Um, yeah. So, you know, you have five, six classes like that, and then you go out and do coaching of something or other. So um, this has really been close. And then with the little, with the grade schoolers, you know, you, they're coming from multi-generational homes and not really like teenagers usually have their own spaces, you know, so we have all of that clustering of uh, intergenerational families. So it's, uh, it's the, um, it's very dangerous for everybody going both ways. Like you said, kids in some respects are much safer in school and some are much safer at home. And so I've been going both ways. It's a two-way street for this virus to just happen.
gangbusters day, going wherever it wants. So anyway, those are the kinds of things that have haunted me about teachers being put in the position of uh, being forced or encouraged to get back to school or lose their paycheck or something, and then they have to expose themselves in such a, um, a really terrible way, really. So um, yeah, that's why. So, so we're, we're excited the fact that teachers are now uh, being inoculated and, and, and we're gonna continue to have to work through this phase 1B throughout the month of February, but we look forward to being able shortly thereafter to get into 1C, which is people 65 and above and other essential workers who have not yet uh, qualified and been vaccinated. And sometime this summer, we expect that we'll be able to open it up for anybody um, over the age of uh, 16 and older who wants to be vaccinated. So we're excited about those things. I'll tell well, you what. Yeah, there's a question. So let me ask the question to you. Sure. If the vaccines are free, why do I have to present my health care insurance when I register? You you actually don't. Um, the the um, Some of the providers would like you to bring uh, your um, insurance card with you, but you absolutely don't. In fact, I have, I have a 90-year-old mother, and it, it warmed my heart because I was able to take her to get uh, vaccinated. She got her first shot of Moderna, and I took her to one of our Department of Health sites, which was over on the Windward side uh, that she registered for, and uh, she did not bring her um, insurance card. And uh, absolutely nobody will be denied or should be denied a vaccine because they don't have insurance. Um, these vaccinations, these doses, they are a public commodity and, and we, we can't deny it um, to, to someone who just because they don't have insurance. Um, absolutely not. Uh, th this needs to be given to the rich and the poor across the board. Very good. Well, we're getting a little short on time here. So let me ask you, uh, knowing there's no crystal ball, but can you suggest uh, uh, what it's going to be like going forward? I mean, I hear a lot of uh, success already and, and much accomplishment. So what do you see going ahead and what roadblocks or impediments might actually pop up? Maybe they wouldn't even be here in Hawaii. Maybe they'd be federal. But anyway, what, what do you see our, is our path forward? Well, right now we're dealing with a supply shortage, but we certainly hope that we have uh, more doses coming in uh, before long. And as that ramps up, uh, we will get the shots in arms. Um, we, we've just got to stick with the plan, keep going through phase 1B, 1C, uh, and sometime this summer, hopefully available to everybody. It's important that everyone know that even after they get a vaccination, they should continue to wear the mask, to physical distance and avoid large gatherings. Uh, we really want to use all the tools in our toolbox. The vaccine is one of them, but certainly the mask, the physical distancing, those are other very important tools. Um, the vaccine is not a panacea, but used in concert with the other things, uh, I think we're going to be able to beat COVID-19. And one quick message, there's a big football game coming up, and we know that some people traditionally like to get together and have a big party to watch that football game. This year would be a bad year to get together and do that. Try to watch at home with just people who are already in your household bubble, and that will prevent you from being exposed to other people and perhaps sharing COVID-19. Well, what about a few big screens up in Alamoana Park or Kapiolani? Uh, outdoor is way better than indoor. The air helps dissipate uh, the droplets in the air, so that would be that would be a better idea. But again, big gatherings not a good idea best just to stay home and cheer for your team because we all want to be around next year for next year's game i want to do that well i it's a, it's getting to be aloha time here and uh we'll have to close um and um appreciate your uh pro projections and also your admonition to watch the super bowl at home with your own bowl of popcorn or whatever treat you really like and I know there are many treats that you like and can have there easily, even easier than being outside or at, a, at someone else's house. But this is um, the uh, state of the state of Hawaii uh, program on Think Tech live streaming network. And we've been talking remotely with Brooks Baer, who's spokesperson from the Department of Health here in Hawaii. And we appreciate all of the information he has shared and we look forward to continuing to see a tremendous uh, accomplishment coming out of, of that agency in our state government. Thank you so much, Brooks. Thank you, Stephanie. We'll keep working on it. We really wanna protect people and save lives. Thank you for this opportunity and be well. Aloha, see you in, in two weeks on Mondays. It's the state of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention.